Well, she asked God for a microphone, but instead he gave her a broom and she showed herself to be faithful. And over the years, God took her across the world to build love to the nations and Abba House to minister to orphans. And now that, that ministry is gonna to begin to spread around the whole wide world. She's just written a brand new amazing book called Sacred Smallness that you're gonna to wanna to get your hands on because it really is gonna transform how you think about what God has called you to do and how you're gonna to get to the divine purpose that you know that God has laid out before you. But how do you get there? She's gonna break that down for us. We're so thankful to have her on Encounter today. Let's go on into the interview with Jenny Papapostolo. All right, Sister Jenny, so this all started with this radical prayer that you prayed that's really given birth uh, to the book that you've written. We're going to place the, the, the link for this book in the description, Sacred Smallness, which is, a, which is a tremendous read, and it started with this, God, I don't care what it looks like as long as I'm following you. Can you tell me kind of the what was surrounding that moment when you cried out to God with that prayer? Definitely. Well, I would say what was surrounding that moment, first of all, my thoughts of and my expectations of what I thought life was going to be, what I thought life was supposed to be. Um, you know, we've talked about it, how when you grow up in ministry or you're surrounded by ministry and you see conferences and churches and you see, you know, maybe you're close to someone who has made it far, you know, and, and what people know as ministry and you you sort of gain the sense of entitlement that, oh, this is what my life will look like, no doubt. Um, so I had all these thoughts, you know, surrounding me and these expectations and this entitlement, not in a pride. I didn't know it was a prideful way. I believe, like, sometimes we have dreams from God, and then He just needs some time to purify our motives. Yeah. Even though it's a God dream, it could have man-made motives. So... Yeah. Um, you know, I, at that time that I prayed that prayer, I had no idea what my life was going to look like. I, I knew God had called me to preach the gospel, but in my mind, preaching the gospel meant standing on a stage and holding a microphone. So, you know, I was telling the Lord, I, I had sensed from him this invitation to, well, at the time I had no idea, but <laughs> when I knew the answer from him, when I knew that he wanted me to pick up my life and move overseas to this hidden village in Greece. I knew that I was saying goodbye to the picture of Christian ministry and this Christian ladder that, you know, Christian ministry ladder that I, I feel like so many of us have been tempted to climb just for the sake of getting to the top, yes. if that makes sense. Um, and so I remember just putting my hands out before the Lord. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care if it feels like I'm just dropping rungs from this influence that I feel like I have built up. Because um, anything that we have built up is fragile anyway. And I want to just tell the Lord, like, if it's anything I've built on my own, please let that fall. Because I do not want my life to be built on that. And so when I told the Lord that, I knew I didn't know what I was getting into, but I had a little glimpse because if I knew what I was getting into, I don't know. I would have still said yes, but it would have been, you know, more difficult. Um, so that was my prayer. It was a prayer of surrender. And um, I had to cons consistently pray that. And even still, you know, that's my prayer before the Lord. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what life looks like. I don't care if it looks completely different than the plan I had for my life. If I have your voice speaking in my heart, if I'm following it, I just want to be with you. I just want your presence, and I just want your pleasure of of following what you have invited us to do. Well, it's so important, and I think a lot of people who are watching this, listen, you're struggling, and you know God's called you to do something. You're not sure what it is. You've had some dreams, some aspirations, maybe been dashed to pieces. You need to get sacred smallness. The journey is raw, it is real, it is inspiring, and as you lay this out, I can even feel it when you were begin to talk about the importance of the word available. I could feel how kind of raw that was and real that was, especially if you come, like you and I, have, have, have roots in mega ministry, big ministry, but then to just lay that on the altar and make yourself available to whatever. Tell me about that, that revelation of 
available and why that word is so important. Yeah, definitely. Well, so whenever the Lord began to stir my heart and to be available, of course, I look it up in the dictionary because that's the first thing you do, right? (laughs) So I looked it up in the dictionary and the definition was to be suitable or ready for use. So again, in my mind, I need to be available to God to be a suitable or ready for use, to hold a microphone, to stand on a stage. Well, lo and behold, he actually meant to be available to go behind the scenes, (laughs) to be suitable and ready for use, to go in a kitchen, cooking, cleaning. That's why the first chapters I asked for a mic and God gave me a broom. Um, Okay, wait, you got, can can you walk through that just a little bit? Because that was so powerful. You asked for a mic and God gave you a broom. Walk us through (laughs) that moment. You don't have to get the book to get all the details, but tell us about that transition in, in your life right there. Well, so my grandparents, Kenneth and Gloria Copeland, maybe you've heard of them, maybe you haven't, um, but I had this um, this call from God. God had asked me to help them. So this was my primary goal, you know, is just to help them, but I didn't know how to help them. I was a, a ORU dropout, and my major was worship leadership, so I'm like, Okay, here I am. Like, what skills do I have? Worship I dropped school out dropout. Worship, worship school. <laughs> I know. That's, that's what I feel every time I say it. Like, I need to start singing the song. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I had this, you know, invitation from God to help my grandparents. So I didn't know what I was going to do for them, but I just knew, okay, this is what God's asked me to do. I really believe that if God puts a desire in someone's heart or a call— if your heart is before the Lord, you can't do anything else but what He's asked you to do. So um, so I was there to help my grandparents, and I would call them every day, do you need help, do you need help, do you need help? And they'd always say no. And then I began to hear this from the Lord to be available. And so, you know, nothing had really panned out on helping them. I would go on a few trips with them, maybe make my grandpa tea, you know, just help them with whatever. And um, so I remember hearing this word and then sensing it was time to be available. So I quit my job at the church bookstore and told them, you know, it's the church bookstore. So you can tell them I need to be available to God. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, I, I, it was my last day and I get a call from my grandparents and they say, Jenny, uh, please come to our house. We would like to talk to you. So I'm like, okay. So I go to their house and they say, our nutritionist has to leave the country. He had some visa issues and they said, would you be available? And they used that word available. Mm. Would you be available to help us and cook for us? And I'm like, excuse me, what cook? (laughs) Like the last time that I cooked, I made, I remember making my family sick when I made spaghetti. That was a a very vivid memory I had (laughs) in the kitchen. And then the other vivid memory I had in the kitchen was doing this crazy creative green eggs and ham for my little brother for his birthday. So I'm thinking, do you know who you're asking to help you in this? Like, I'll help you with anything else, but cooking, I'm not sure you know what you're getting into, but I knew from the Lord, this is what he had wanted for me to do. So I said, yes. And for three years, I was in that place of behind the scenes, I really consider, you know, ministry is not standing on a stage holding a microphone. Mm -hmm. Maybe it looks like that sometimes, Mm -hmm. but ministry at its core is love and ministry at its core is servanthood. So I really believe that's when my ministry began, not when I was in front of thousands of people, but when I was in front of two people and really in front of the Lord. And that's why when we have a heart of servanthood in ministry, we are satisfied. Our heart is satisfied and our heart is content because we realize, you know, I'm just here to serve. I'm not here to gain and gather so many people. I'm just here to serve and say yes. And again, say to the Lord, I don't care what it looks like as long as I'm following you. Isn't that interesting that you have these aspirations, these dreams, things that God has placed in you, And you say, all right, God, here I am. I'm available for you. And he doesn't put a microphone in your hand. He puts a broom in your hand. And I think a lot of people miss it because they're looking for the microphone. They're looking for the stage. They're looking for that big show, the lights being on them. And they don't realize that the real victory is faithful surrender and availability to the Lord. And 
as you go through this journey in the book, this even struck me when you begin to unpack the story of the Good Samaritan and you saw yourself in a different light than you had seen it before. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. You, well, you know, like when you read the scripture sometime, you just assume you're the, you're the good guy or you're the one on the good <laughs> side. And I'm re- one day I'm reading the Good Samaritan and the Lord had in that time began stirring my heart that there's more, you know, I grew up I'm so thankful for my upbringing, so thankful for going to conferences and churches. And, and I love that so much. Um, it's a very important part of the kingdom, but uh, it's not the only part. And I really talk about that in the book. And so I, God began stirring my heart to get my hands dirty in ministry. You know, like, I remember one time, this is going to sound, I don't know how this is going to sound. I'm just going to go for it. But I remember one time I had never been on like public transportation, which is so embarrassing when I tell it now, (laughs) but, um, this was probably 10 years ago. And so one day my brother and I went on public transportation and I felt like a fish out of water, but it was like, man, where have I been? Why? Have I been like cooped up in this like cathedral of comfort, this Mm. white gloved, sanitized Christianity? And I think that I am being like Christ. Like, if I actually look at Jesus and look at his life, then I have realized that he was not the one always in, you know, the the cars by himself. He was the one on public transportation. Mm-hmm. He was with people. He was always willing to get his hands dirty with people. And so I began to read the scripture and realizing, oh my, oh my goodness, like my life looks more like a religious leader, like a Pharisee or a Sadducee than it does how Jesus would be. He is compassionate. He doesn't, he is not afraid of people's sin. He is not afraid of people's dirt. Like he, if he could choose, he's going to be in the place where his hands will get dirty. Mm -hmm. I heard someone say once, I don't remember who it was or I'd give him credit. So I'm just going to take it. Um, (laughs) I remember hearing this preacher once say, if you walked down the aisle of a plane and somebody there, you, you can choose whatever seat you want. And there's a seat next to this guy who is like coughing up a lung. He's so sick. You feel like the germs are just spreading everywhere. You could sit there or you could sit in a row by yourself. Which one are, are you going to choose? So most likely all of us will choose our own little space. That's right. By myself. <laughs> yes, yes, please. You can stay over here. <laughs> but the love of God hmm. will sit right next to the man who is in pain and hurting. And, and the love of God is always willing to get its hands dirty. So I I began to realize like, God, I'm, my heart is stirring for more. I didn't grow up like this, but my heart is stirring for more. And so I would read this good Samaritan story. And, you know, you have a man that has been beaten by the side of the road and these religious leaders, these holy men pass by him and do nothing. And I realize it's it's not the time to do nothing. God is calling us to do something. God is calling us not just to say, oh, bless you, brother. And we can feel so spiritual, and, but actually to physically do something, not just sit in our seats, look nice, look pretty, make sure we're wearing the right thing, make sure someone's looking at us. I mean, I'm going to be really honest, like, this was a while ago, so you you don't have to judge me now. But I remember being in services and raising my hands thinking, who's looking at me? I mean, how prideful is that? Hmm. Like, it's horrible. It's horrible. But um, God began to stir that out of me. Like, that is that is not, that doesn't belong in, in a, the heart of a minister. That doesn't belong in the heart of a believer. Like, God is calling us to have this wild compassion that is willing to get its hands dirty for the one who is hurting. And, um, you know, it was, it was the outcast that came to the aid of this man. And, and so anyway, I just, I, I stopped looking in the scriptures and assuming that I was the, 
one on the right side. I was like, Lord, search my heart. Hmm. Know my heart. See if there's anything in me that doesn't please you. And that's where I want to go. That's what I want to do. That's who I want to be. More than anything, I want to be someone who pleases the Lord. Which ultimately is just being available for whatever. Yes. And when you make yourself available, he can take you into places you could have never even dreamed were possible or imaginable. In fact, if you're watching this, I want you to write in the comments, Lord, I'm available. Just write that down if you're praying that prayer with us right now. So how does this revelation then progress into the birth of Love to the Nations, Abba House, and talk to us a little bit about where that came from and where it is now? Yeah, definitely. So um, around the time I was helping my grandparents and working with them, cooking again, <laughs> um, I, whenever I was 17 years old, my parents went through divorce, which again is messy. Again, nobody wants to talk about those things, but again, it's happening. So I really believe that God is like calling this church out into a church of authenticity, yes. not just covering things under a rug because it doesn't look good. Mm -hmm. You know, God is calling us to be honest. Like the scripture says, he sees everything. We are, are open before him. Nothing is hidden. Everything is made manifest in his sight. Nothing in all creation is hidden from him. So anyway, um, so I had written this book to young people whose parents had gone through divorce about the father's love. You know, the name of it is Abba, finding comfort in the father after your parents divorce. So as I, as I began to re write this book, God begins to open my heart to receive his love as a father. Um, you can be in church your whole life. And if you can have the best dad in the entire universe, you know, you're the best earthly father. But if you have not opened your heart to the heavenly father, mm. then there's something that is missing. You know, his love is so perfect. It's so wonderful. Um, and so as I'm writing this, God begins to just open my heart to who he is to me as a father. And so the more that I knew his love as a father, I saw that he adopted us. He took us to a place out of a place of darkness into a new family, out of a, into a kingdom of light. We have a new name. And so like, like we said about the good Samaritan, you know, God isn't just like, Oh, bless you and send you on your way. He actually wants us to physically do something. Um, so I began uh, as I would read about the fatherless not just spiritual orphans, but I'm realizing, oh, I see here in James, pure and undefiled religion is helping the widow and the orphans in their trouble. That's not spiritual, only spiritual widows or spiritual orphans. Those are physical orphans. And the church has this call. The church has this assignment from God. And I always say, the more you know the heart of the father, the louder you hear the cry of the orphan. Mm. There, you cannot separate them. You cannot truly know God's heart as a father and not hear the cry of the orphan. Um, so the more I knew the heart of the father, the louder those cries would be in my heart. And, and, you know, again, this wasn't something that I grew up around, you know. And um, so God just put this burden and put this assignment on my heart for the fatherless. I would just weep. You know, he put this assignment for the nations where I never thought, like, maybe I would move to another state, but never in a million years did I think, oh, I'm going to move to another country. So God began putting these assignments. And I just told the Lord, like, I know there's a need. Just show me where to pour out. So any place that I would go. So I had transitioned. I wasn't cooking for my grandparents anymore. Um, and I was now it was the time to hold a microphone. Hmm. Um and I think that's, that's, you know, something too, that your season, every season changes. You're never in the season forever, you know, every season changes. So um, the Lord had brought me to a place where I was so comfortable being behind the scenes. I was like, okay, God, I'm good being behind the scenes. I'm yeah. just going to stay here and with my little broom. <laughs> he was like, nope, here's a mic, go ahead. Um, I feel like I go through seasons like that often. And um, anyway, but I realized that my heart was ready to hold a microphone, you know, and I was so thankful to the Lord that I did not promote myself when it was my time mm. to go out. But I allowed the Lord to purify motives, to prune things that needed to be pruned. Anyway, 
So um, I was I was preaching at different places, and every place I would go, because this assignment was on my heart, are there orphans here? What's the orphan crisis like? Is there an orphanage close by? So whenever I would preach, I would, I would go and, and find a place, a children's home, and just seeing it or serving. And I'm, I've just had my heart open before the Lord. Is there a place? Do you want me to, you know, partner with this person, donate? Not that I had much money anyway, but whatever I can do. Um, I was like, Lord, just show me, you know, where to pour out. So I was invited to Greece and Bulgaria uh, to speak at a youth conference. And I was like, I remember going, <laughs> it's so funny. I remember going thinking, I just, I don't really feel like a call to Greece, really. I just like love my friends there. So I'm just going to go <laughs> <laughs> seven years later <laughs> with the last name, Papa Bastolo. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so I went and again, the same question that I would ask everywhere, you know, are there abandoned children here? Is what's the orphan crisis like? And they, uh, my friends I was with told me, yes, the orphan crisis is so big because of the financial crisis, because of the refugee crisis, um, there's a, a, a huge need. And so they're telling me this, which I've heard this statement, you know, I've heard, you know, the state of different countries mm-hmm. with the orphan crisis multiple times. But for some reason, the Lord, I said, well, what if we started an orphanage? I had no idea, no earthly idea what we were doing. But I knew as soon as I said that, it was like the fire of God fell in my heart. And I knew this is what he wants us to do. And it's been miraculous. You know, um, that was, I was actually planning to just live in America and stay in Greece, like for a few months, which, which months, which actually sounds like a vacation. <laughs> um so, but it was in that prayer, you know, I don't care what it looks like as long as I'm following you. And that's how mm. I got there to Greece. And God has just done so many miracles. Um, you know, Abba House, we are open to, we host children, all different, you know, from all different walks of life. Um, we are helping with the Ukrainian refugee crisis, helping. We have a program called Ikoyenya Mazi, which means family together. And basically, there's a lot of children that are in homes all around the world that have a loving mother or a loving father that are separated due to social, socioeconomic mm-hmm. situations. And so they call them social orphans. So there are so many of those. Like, actually, the majority. I can't say that for sure, but it seems like the majority of children and homes are actually have living parents. They just cannot provide for them. So when we began this program, uh, four of the children that had been in our home for probably three or four years, they just in the last uh, two years got reunited with their mother and were uh-huh. supporting them, helping her with, um, you know, job training, schooling, like to get her on her feet, helping her with housing, just stepping in so that the trauma of se- separation wouldn't even have to take place. So anyway, that's what we're doing. We're, we tell the Lord, you know, whatever, however we can help, wherever we can help. And we have an amazing team. Actually, the director, Leonis, she's my best friend. She's actually my husband's cousin. So we are literally all family. All family. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. It's so. all from getting a revelation of the heart of the Father. And I think, you know, much of the church, when you look at traditional camps like Baptists, they've got, they've been baptized in Christ, they're baptized in water. And then you've got another camp, the Pentecostal, they're baptized in the Holy Spirit. But there needs to be, and I believe there's coming, this swell of a great baptism of the heart of the Father that we've been missing. And I think for too long, we've settled for what you talk about in the book, golden calves, as a replacement for that. What do you mean by that when you say we've settled for golden calves? Well, if you look at what satisfies people other than the presence of God, Hmm. um, there's golden calves in the world, obviously, but there's golden calves in the church, you know, and I talk about in the book, 
lights and cameras and like fog machines, like all these things within themselves in and of themselves are not bad. Like I really believe that these are tools that God can use. You know, actually the other day someone told me about a church. They're like, oh, they just are so creative. I'm like, and that is bad because <laughs> like, <laughs> that is, it's not a bad thing to yeah. be creative, to, you know, be trendy, to be these things. But is that the heart of it? Is that the source of your message? Is that the source of life? Is this what draws people or is it, is, do you need this to have an encounter with God? Um, and whatever you need to have an encounter with God over the presence of God, that has become a golden calf. Because if you see in the scriptures and, you know, Moses goes up to the mountain and everybody's, everybody's like, well, where's Moses? We, we don't have a, someone to look to. And Aaron was just like, well, bring all your gold and let's make a golden calf. And they were satisfied with that. Mm -hmm. They had just been led out of captivity and bondage and so quickly, which, you know, it's easy to judge. But what would we do in that situation? Um, well, I've never seen manna come down from heaven. So I don't know. <laughs> but, um, but they saw the glory of God. They saw the pillar of, you know, fire and the cloud and and. They still Settle. were tempted. They still settled for golden mm. calves and and this idol that can't save them, you know. And so I believe that uh, there's a lot of golden calves, and and we have to be on guard, you know. I if I am in a church service and I allow myself to not have an encounter with God due to anything, whether there, the music isn't good enough for me or the lights aren't good enough for me mm -hmm. or the lights are too good for me you know we can have all these preferences to how we worship the lord and okay you can have preferences but don't allow that yes. to affect your in intimacy and your encounter with jesus christ and so um fame can be a golden calf because mm -hmm. we feel like once we hit it we are pleasing to god um, fame is a part of many people's stories, even in, in ministry. You know, the fame of Jesus went about, but Jesus wasn't about fame. He was about the Father's will. And um, I think only we can know, you know, the state of our heart. And am I allowing fame? Have I made it now? Or am I allowing fame to come before encountering for myself? the presence and the goodness of God. And it's not just fame for people who maybe they don't, they can't relate with that because they're going, it's pecking order. You know, it's, it's mm -hmm. feeling satisfied with where you are in your relationships with others. Do you feel trodden over? Do you feel looked over? Do you feel that, that needing more is the same as seeking fame? It's the exact same thing. And it robs us of our worship, which you so beautifully go into in the final chapter of the book, Worship School Dropout gives us an education on <laughs> what re what real worship is. No, really, because I think you dropped out of school to live it out, right? Uh, to, mm. to live what real worship was like in sacrifice. Talk to us about how, I think, I think you worded it this way, that everything is worship, but then you define what that means. Yeah, so basically this woman, you know, but the same thing we were talking about with the Good Samaritan, like you mm -hmm. read the scripture and you're like, man, I'm on the good side. I know Jesus. And so, again, I'm like allowing the Lord to show me, you know, who am I in this account? So you have the story of the woman who the sinful woman who heard that Jesus was in town and goes into the home of a Pharisee. I mean, Hmm. Talk about boldness. Talk about not caring at all what anybody thinks about her, what people have said about her, just allowing all those things to fall to the wayside because Jesus Christ was in front of her. And so she heard Jesus was there and she wanted to give him an act of worship. And so she goes into the home. The Pharisees are looking at her as she's showering and, and loving Jesus with her tears and her perfume that is so costly. And she breaks that box of fragrance on his feet. And that to me is unashamed worship. That's allowing, you know, allowing everything that this woman was, it allowed it to fall at his feet. Mm. And I'm reading this, this passage 
and I'm, it just hit me like, man, I, I used to think that I couldn't be emotional in worship and realizing, wow, I'm so glad Jesus didn't tell this woman, you're just being too emotional right now. You need to, you need to be more in the spirit, ma'am, missus. And, um, you know, I've heard that before, like, oh, that's just an, an emotional song. It's I'm not like, necessary. of course it's an emotional. Yeah, it's not, it's necessary. not necessary. You're just a little it, too it, emotional. It doesn't take all that. <laughs> yeah. And and I'm realizing, like, man, I've kept, I've reserved my emotions from the Lord because I thought I couldn't love him with them. You know, it's one thing to to be led by your emotions, be led. You know, we have to be led by the Spirit, but it's another thing to love God with our emotions. And when I read that and realized like, man, I haven't, I don't feel like I'm allowed to cry in worship. I don't feel like I'm allowed to laugh or sing or no, not sing. I guess that's worship. I mean, that's part of worship, (laughs) but I, I just felt, you know, that I wasn't allowed to be emotional. And then when I'm realizing this, that Jesus did not tell this lady that she's too emotional. He allowed her to worship fully everything she was worship with her whole heart and soul and mind and strength and so i was like god i want to be this woman i don't want to be the religious leader that jesus walks into the room and i don't anoint his head and i don't anoint his feet and i don't lay on the ground like i don't give everything these religious leaders were more more focused on jesus presence what jesus how do i say this these religious leaders were more focused on how Jesus's presence would affect and impact their reputation hmm. than letting their reputation fall before the feet of Jesus. You know, like maybe they thought, well, here, here I am. I can say that now I've rubbed shoulders with Jesus. No, they didn't. The woman that, that fell at his feet, she didn't care about anything. She was there to worship him, not think about anything. And and so I wanted to be that woman. You know, I, I asked the Lord, how do I do this? I wrote a song called Pour My Worship, where I just, the words are, I, would, I will not reserve love for the one deserving. And so this became my prayer, you know. And the thing is, in this alabaster box, I began to see it like this alabaster box. Every one of us have an alabaster box Hmm. and we, we put our worship, we put our, our skills and our goals and all, everything we are is contained in this little alabaster box. And I think so many, and we ask, we have to ask ourselves, am I throwing and breaking my alabaster box at the feet of Jesus? Or am I throwing and breaking my alabaster box at the feet of men? You know, and um, because this this contained so uh, the worth, like the woman's dowry, it contained everything. And she traditionally, historically, she broke it at the feet of her her soon to be groom. You know, she broke it Mm. there because and this woman, when she broke this box of perfume at the feet of Jesus, she was saying my whole life measured up. You are worth more. So I'm going to break it to receive you and what you, who you are, you know? And he said about this woman, he said, her worship is going to be talked about. And it is. So anyway, everything is worship, you know, like, Worship isn't just contained in, in four chords or, you know, yeah. songs or anything like that. It's everything is worship. And I, I learned that. And especially like getting married, you know, I was a single woman in ministry and I was just like, okay, well, moving across the world is like nailing the, or uh, hitting the nail in the cof- coffin of singleness <laughs> forever. Like who wants to marry somebody that, you know, is all about orphans and homes and living somewhere else. But uh, someone did, thankfully. Um, but then, you know, going into a season of marriage, and now we have an eight-month-old little boy who is just so wonderful and so precious. Um, but I've had to realize that worship and ministry is not just, again, standing on a stage holding a microphone. Worship can be changing a diaper. That's a holy service to the Lord. And, and all these things that we do in our life, these are holy services 
done unto the Lord. Whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it all unto the glory of God. We can live this way where every single thing we do, it's like we are doing it unto his glory. Um, Bill Johnson uh, or Jen Johnson told the story once um, where she was having a busy day as a mom, you know, and she gets in the car to go to church to lead worship. And she says, okay, mom hat off, worship hat on. And Bill, of course, with all his wisdom is sitting in the front seat. And he said, the problem is your worship hat should have never come off. Hmm. And when I'm hearing that, I'm thinking, oh, wow. Like that is it completely. We continually wear our garment of grace continually. And there was one, one time where I was um, up in the home at Abba house, that's Niki, And I was sitting there and there was a, a time when I first got there where I lived in the house, there was like this little hobbit room up there. Mm-hmm. Like I'm five, two, pushing five three and there's this bathroom that literally like goes to here i'm not kidding it is so short i don't even know who had the idea to create this anyway i guess it's for everybody (laughs) like anyway so i remember being in my room and i was listening to worship eric gilmore uh i was listening to his worship and i was like oh i'm so blessed and and we had just began, begun the house. We had around three children at the time. And I'm, I'm hearing these children start waking up. And I, I knew I was supposed to go down. And I was like, oh, God, I just, I love worshiping you right here. I just want to stay here and worship. And you can, you can figure out what came next. And the Lord is like, the moment you get up, go downstairs and, and are with these children, loving these children. He said, you're worshiping me. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, personally, we're so thankful that we get to worship Jesus in this way. We get to worship Jesus by loving the ones closest to us, to his heart. So whether you are at home watching this, you're a stay at home, mom, stay at home, dad, or in the, you know, in the professional field or whatever, and you're doing your services unto the Lord, this is worship before mm. him. Our whole life, can be an act of worship before him. And, and that's the legacy more than anything, more than anything in our life. I believe the legacy that we want to live is the legacy of a worshiper. And you take us through that in the book. And uh, in a minute, I want you to pray for us that that, that that anointing would come on us. So that understanding revelation, the spirit of the father would be with us. But first I want to, I want to tell the audience, you need to get a copy of this book and let her walk you through the details of this, because you're going to find yourself in this journey. And if you're struggling with smallness, if you're if you're battling pride, if you're battling entitlement, or if you feel like you're expendable, or you battle self-hatred, this book is going to help you find your place in Christ and in the love of the Father. And I want to say this to the audience very quickly. This, this ministry is a ministry worth sowing into, and you know our culture, you know our heart, but I believe more than at any other time, we need to sow into this work and be a blessing to uh, Sister Jenny for her time with us today and to thank them for their availability to serve God in the sacred smallness. So I want you to go to EncounterToday.com and give however you're led by the Holy Spirit, and we will take that and we will add to it, and we're going to send it to be a blessing to this tremendous ministry. Sister Jenny, we, we can't thank you enough for putting pen to paper, doing the work to live this book before you wrote it. Could you could you pray for us that we would get the revelation of the heart of the Father as as we sow into this work and as we begin to study the words that you've written? Absolutely. Well, if you're listening, if you're watching, I just invite you to close your eyes mm-hmm. and allow the Father to encounter your heart. I believe that there are people that have had a lack of the love of the Father and you have been so you've been striving for it, you've been hungry for it. And maybe you didn't even know that that's what you needed. But in the name of Jesus, Father, I pray over every single listener right now, every single viewer. And I I just pray right now that they sense your presence tangibly. Yes. Father, I pray that your love is, is overflowing in their heart. Touch them, Lord. Touch their heart. I ask that you bring your healing love. Your healing love, the the love of the Father to come and heal every wound. Lord, you are more than enough. 
who you are is more than enough. And we thank you for it. You are worthy, Jesus. And again, I just thank you for your love, for your presence over them. And and right now, in the, in the name of Jesus, I just put your hands out hmm. and say to the Lord, I receive your love. My Father loves me. My Father loves me. You know, if you ever are struggling with feeling loved by God, just stop for a minute. Put your hand on your heart and say, my father loves me. My father loves me. I don't have to worry about what I'm going to drink or what I'm going to wear or what I'm going to eat because my father knows that I have need of these things and my father loves me. So we thank you for your love and we receive it, Lord, and stir our heart. Stir our heart more for the ones that that are so important to your heart. Lord, stir our heart for glory. Stir our heart for your presence, your true, authentic presence in our life. We don't want to live any in any lesser life, God. This is what we want. We want you and nothing else. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name. If you receive that, just write in the comments, I receive, and the link for the book is in the description, Sacred Smallness. You're going to love it. You're going to want to get it as a gift for uh, friends and family members. It's going to be a great blessing to them. And Jenny, if I can twist your arm for a few more minutes, I'm going to take you over to the podcast, (laughs) and I want to ask you a few questions about the book you wrote about finding comfort in the midst of divorce and other difficulties and struggles. So we're going to take just a few minutes to do that very quickly, but thank you for being with us on Encounter today. Thank you. (laughs) And thank you all for joining us. Be sure to share this message. Let's get it out in front of as many people as possible. And be sure to go to EncounterToday.com for more information about all the things that we're doing and to be able to sow into this great ministry. Thank you all for joining us. We'll see you over on the podcast. God bless.